Segment two, church and state. Two quotations. <clears throat> December 2007, last presidential cycle, Mitt Romney. Quote, let me assure you that no authorities of my church or any other church for that matter will ever exert influence on presidential decisions. Close quote. June 2011, this presidential cycle, Rick Santorum. Quote, the understanding of the world that my Catholicism gives me, the world as it should be, an understanding of human nature and the ordering of our common affairs, that is important to me as a public official. Being religious and my proud and my being consciously Catholic is something to be proud of. Close quote. Romney, here's my religion. Here's me as a candidate. Santorum, you can't separate the two. Which do you find more persuasive? Uh, the, the the latter. I mean, I, I think, you, look, I mean, if, if, if Romney is taking orders from the, the bishops of the Mormon church, that's bad. If Santorum is taking orders from the Catholic church, that's bad. Um, but beyond the sort of physical manipulation, I mean, beyond the sort of direct exertion of authority over somebody where, you know, basically someone is being manipulated, the idea that somehow you can keep someone's religious faith out of their actions just strikes me as utterly implausible. Um, you know, you can't say if someone was an orphan and then grew up to run for president, you'd yeah. say, well, my childhood experience was really important to me. Well, if someone was raised in a certain church and takes their faith seriously, that's going to be important to them too. And why you can't factor that in as a voter or anything else and say, hey, look, this guy is pro-life because he's Catholic and um, I'm, you know, and the motives don't matter. It's the positions that okay, matter. Okay, so that's a weak form of an argument. That is to say, people are shaped by their religion. We ought to have an honest discussion about it. So let me. So the next step, the stronger form of the argument would be, and that is a good thing. Do you say that? Yeah. No. I mean, I don't know how I, you can avoid that. I mean, look. I mean, uh, I mean, well, you could say, well, one way or. Santorum, we have to talk about Santorum's Catholic. I would rather not to. It's distasteful. I wish it weren't the case, but we have to talk about it. That's one way of putting it. The other way of putting it is, look, this guy, is, he, he'll tell you exactly how, his, how the teachings of his church inform his political views. That's wonderful. Well, let's put it this way. Candidates have a, an obligation to explain what they're going to do. Right. And if a candidate is going to explain what they're going to do, in invariably what's going to creep in there is why does he want to do it? Right. And if he says that the reason why I want to build public schools is because I'm a Catholic, that's fine by me if it's smart to build the public schools. You know, right. okay. and that's all it is. The, getting obsessed about the motives about all this stuff I find uh, pointless to a certain extent. I mean, I, I am for a strong national defense even if the president is an atheist or if he's a Satanist. Um, it, the, the positions on the policies don't really matter. It's helpful to know where these guys are coming from, and I think there's no reason why they can't say that's where they're coming from. Newt Gingrich. And finally, many of you may have noticed that the Obama administration has declared war on the Catholic Church and other religious institutions. I want you to know that on the very first day, I will sign an executive order repealing every anti-religious act of the Obama administration as of that moment. War on the Catholic Church and other religious institutions. Fair statement. Uh, acceptable if you give a little leeway because that was primary night in Florida and everybody's spirits were high even if he'd lost. Yeah. Well, you know you don't like it. You know you're uncomfortable with that formulation. Um, look, Newt contains multitudes. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> uh, and he is, uh, you know, I, I've been calling him in columns now for a while, Newtzilla. You know, I mean, rah, that's how he sort of approaches these things. And um, so, do I think it's a war on religion? Uh, yes and no. I think that, that definitely within liberalism, this goes back to you know, the, my stuff from liberal fascism, liberalism or progressivism, however you want to call it, what it shares with a lot of the other isms of the left is this totalizing vision that uh, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski and others, they, they defined totalitarianism as societies where there can be no islands of separateness. Mm -hmm. every, every ore must pull in the same way. The, Nazi, the Nazis used to talk about the Gleichschaltung, which meant coordinate, coordination. It was a term borrowed from electrical engineering. And when you look at what 
the way what progressives, how progressives want religion to be treated in America, right? If you take the intellectuals who are honest and serious about this, they want to get rid of the tax breaks or tax exempt status for religious institutions. They, you know, we just saw recently with Obama saying that the Catholic institutions have to allow for coverage of, of uh, birth, birth control, control and all that kind of stuff. Um, they don't recognize that religion is an island of separateness from the progressive cause. And um, and so the, in well, that well, sense, they, they, they are at war. I mean, the, the, the important thing about, in the culture war, the thing that the left never wants to acknowledge, and that is, it seems to me incandescently true, is that they are the aggressors. Now, sometimes they've been on the right side. You know, when they were at the forefront of the civil rights movement, conservatives were wrong or, or, or too slow in joining in on that for a while. Um, one can say that they were right on the big picture about feminism, you know, while at the same time they've gone too far and we can have all those conversations that we've had a million times. So I'm not saying that necessarily that simply because they're the aggressor in the culture war, they're always wrong, but they are always the aggressor. And they brag about it. They say they're the forces of progress. They're the ones who want to extend their vision to the every nook and cranny of society. And what they, what drives them batty is resistance. When VMI says, no, we'd like to stay all male. When uh, traditional institutions want to keep their rules, their religious rules or other rules, you know, men's clubs or whatever, they are the aggressors in the culture war. And to that extent, uh, allowing for a lot of Gingrichian license, he is right um, in that Obama is the titular leader of the forces of pro pro progress in America, or progressives in America. And these decisions that he makes are consonant with that longstanding effort going back, you know, 50, 100 years. Okay. Practical political implications of that. As you know, this is a kind of commonplace of American politics, Catholics in this country have been traditionally associated with the Democratic Party. Reagan changes that pattern and it snaps right back under the bushes that the Catholics tend to vote Democratic more than Republican. Now listen to this, which is just a week or so old. His Excellency David Zubik, Bishop of Pittsburgh writes the following in the diocesan newsletter, Pittsburgh, quote, it comes like a slap in the face. The Obama administration has just told the Catholics of the United States to hell with you. There is no other way to put it, close quote. Are we going to get some shifting of the allegiances here? Well, that, depends a lot on Catholic leaders, right, who have to be willing to actually um, put their money, as it were, um, where their mouths are. I mean, the better sign in some ways of how, uh, how uh, contrary-wise or cattywampus Obama is with Catholics was that E.J. Dion wrote a column for the Washington Post. Even E.J. With his dress over the head, over his head about... <laughs> how Obama had abandoned Catholics on this and betrayed progressive Catholics. And, you know, if you've lost E.J. Dionne, I mean, then, I mean, this is, I mean, who do you still Even have? Even the bishops have to start thinking <laughs> twice. Okay, so, so let me ask you this. This, as of, this is before this whole issue broke. Last summer, last summer, Gallup found that whereas 52% of Democrats seldom or never attend religious services, 62% of Republicans attend church or synagogue at least once a month. Mm -hmm. So, it looks as though you're getting a sorting out into the party of God and the party of unbelief. Mm -hmm. Is that healthy for the country? Um, probably not. Um, but who are you going to blame? I mean, I mean, I, I, I think it's it's not healthy. Um, but. At the same time, if you have the party of unbelief making huge strides, it only makes sense that the party of God would um, rally in a sort of antibody response to fight that process. And I'm in favor of these sorts of battles being fought. I mean, it's just because it's ugly to say that, po that politics is being divided along religious fault lines doesn't mean that the the people on the religious side of that fault line should surrender or give up the fight. Um, and it will be awkward because what you're going to get is some extremists or some partisans or some true believers who never having had to sort of think of their politics in religious terms 
may go too far in defining their politics in religious terms, right. and that could be a problem. Right. Um, but on the whole, uh, you know, there's a reason why it's been called the Leave Me Alone Coalition for the last 40 years. The Republican Party, the conservative movement, is a creature that feels put upon by the um, by the left and the, the and the government and for having it views imposed upon it. And I don't think they should lay down just because it makes our politics more ugly. Segment three, diversity. <clears throat> An open letter to the Los Angeles Times. <laughs> you know where this is going already. Quote, the greater Southern California community. Of which you were a part. Well, a Northern, I'm of. Oh, that's the, right, you're a Northern, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, the yeah. Northern California you're community. The, you're the heathens, yeah. Is not one that excuse me, is one that not only proudly embraces its diversity, it's just <laughs> it's just, I don't, you can type it, but you can't read it. One that not only proudly embraces its diversity, but demands it. I am now forced to carefully reconsider which sources can be trusted to provide me with accurate news and opinions. Your new columnist, Jonah Goldberg, will not be one of those sources. Close quote. Signed, Barbara Streisand. Explain. Okay, this is this is really truly one of the highlights of my career, and you know, in, in many ways. I, Where do you go from here? Exactly. I mean, I, I should just walk off the stage. Thank you, everybody. It's been great, um, and picked a new career because it just you know you're supposed to always leave on a high note. Um, when the LA Times picked me up as a columnist, I was one of a bunch of columnists. Which is what three, four, five years ago. Oh, it's, it's 2005. Oh, okay. yeah, it's been a wow. while. Okay. Um, uh, when they picked me up as a columnist. Uh, they also picked up a bunch of others, but the others were not nearly as unpleasant. Uninformed. Un unpalatable Unpa to, right, to right. uh. Undiverse. To, yes, right. And, um, and so it became this thing because they got rid of Robert Shear, who was one of these long-standing gargoyles on the parapets of the left, you know, and, um, and replaced him with me. And the irony here is that I went and looked it up, you know, and, uh, you know Bar so Barbara Streisand has this thing where she thinks diversity you know, it's almost as stupid as that line from the movie Anchorman, where, where Ron Burgundy thinks diversity is an old wooden ship. Um, <laughs> she thinks diversity just means good things, right? It means hearing more voices I already agree with. That's what she thinks is diversity in her media. And so when they replaced Robert Shear with Jonah Goldberg, basically an old uh, Jew with a younger Jew, um, you know, my demographic profile in every other way is, you know, he's of Scotch, he's of German Jewish descent. I'm mostly German Jewish descent. I mean, all basically the same creatures, you know, biologically. Um, what's different is we have different political views. Robert Shear is basically an ideological tutor to Barbara Streisand. Mm -hmm. And so Barbara Streisand's uh, interpretation of what diversity means is hearing stuff that reinforces the views I already believe. And but she can't accept that I'm that having me on board actually makes the views of the Los Angeles Times more diverse, and I, I, I've always found it as this great sort of example of how the left continually uses a lot of these words, like social justice, diversity, um, to just mean good things. And um, the irony is, is that the policies that they they enforce or they pursue basically are the are the antithesis of diversity. The great stronghold of diversity, the modern university. Lee Bollinger, president of Columbia, quote, diversity is not merely a desirable addition to a well-rounded education. It is as essential as the study of the Middle Ages, of international politics, and of Shakespeare. Diversity broadens the mind and the intellect, essential goals of education, close quote. What the heck was wrong with that? That's, well, I mean, other than the fact that it's incredibly stupid, um, <laughs> uh, there's nothing wrong with it, right? I mean, look, I'm in favor of, of uh, I'm in favor of diversity depending on how you mean diversity, right? I mean, obviously, we don't really make, when people say diversity makes things stronger, sometimes they're right, right? Uh, um, a mixed portfolio is a stronger portfolio than one that is invested entirely in pets.com, right? Um, a gene pool that is diverse is healthier and more capable of resisting disease than one that has been inbred over a long time. But an NBA team that is that is well populated with midgets and one-legged women is not as strong as, say, an all-men male team. And uh, my problem with the way Bollinger frames this is what what they're really doing is they're saying that diversity um, is it a key educational tool so that they can make racial quotas and affirmative action and all that kind of stuff permanent. Right. Because once you say it's as essential as Shakespeare, 
Well, you're never going to get rid of Shakespeare. Well, so why? Never, uh, yeah, that's right. But you know, for the purposes of his propaganda, right? You're never going to get rid of math. You're never going to get rid of Shakespeare. You're never going to get rid of diversity. But the thing is, it's just not true as a factual matter. I mean, Aristotle didn't come up in a very diverse community. Um, Socrates, Einstein, all of these people didn't. And meanwhile, the policies that they pursue on these college campuses. Um, under the rubric of diversity, actually lead to balkanization. You have the Black Studies Center, you have the Hispanic Studies Center. Every, I, I've probably visited 60, 70 campuses in the last 10 years for speeches and whatnot. And everywhere I go where they really push diversity, you go to the cafeteria and you see a bunch of black kids sitting with black kids and Hispanic kids sitting with Hispanic kids. You have dorms divided by race sometimes. I mean, it is the idea that somehow you are exposing kids mm -hmm. to a diversity of views by playing these games, I think it's just at minimum not proven. In